Hey, welcome church. It's great to see you again, uh, even if that is over the internet, online. Obviously, I can't really see you, but send your comments in, uh, stay in touch, but hopefully you can see me. As you can see, we're filming this from the church. Uh, we're just going to pan around quickly uh, now so that you can see that the church is uh, completely empty. Uh, and this is what we're having to live with through this pandemic uh, that the coronavirus has brought on. All the normal activities that would take place in church, uh, such as our Sunday services, our midweek meetings, and uh, our parents and toddler group, Little Buds, uh, nothing is happening. We've had to close down completely in every activity that we run here. And this is how it's affecting us, but it's not just us. Uh, worldwide, this virus is affecting everybody. It's causing much confusion, uncertainty, and putting a lot of pressure on very many people. You know, if we can remember at this time and to pray for our National Health Service, the police, the armed forces that are getting involved, the people stocking and working in supermarkets and care homes and, and every other area that uh, I can't name them all, that uh, there are so many people under immense pressure at this time. Um, it's not just us, but as you can see, we've had to stop what we're doing here in our meetings, but it doesn't just affect our meetings for the church congregation. It affects other areas of our church life too. As I said before, it's not just how it affects us as a church congregation with all our meetings, having to stop meeting in person and moving them online, and, and we can do that to a great degree thanks to modern technology. But it's, it's a human interaction, you know, as you can see behind me, the cafe is empty on Wednesdays when we run Cafe Irresistible. This is packed. There's days when we get up to 80 people and we're getting people from right across the community, from the local community to workmen, to health workers, to the old, the vulnerable, who absolutely love meeting together here in this space and really enjoy the meals and the hospitality that Ellen and the team put on. And this has had to stop to two. And it's another example of how this virus and this time that we're going through is leaving so many of us with uncertainty and putting us under pressure, especially if you have a heart to care. Uh, you will be feeling this even more now that you can't reach out, touch and care for people because of the situation we're going through. It's not just inside the church that's affected. Yes, of course we're affected as you've just seen, but it's outside the church as well. This isn't just about us, this is much bigger than us. This affects everybody. Affects everybody associated with this church and not associated with this church. I mean, let's let's just have a look around us now. Just we're going to pan round so that you can see. As you can see, this is normally packed with cars, lots of people walking about, and yet the streets are empty. Hardly anybody about. This really is is having an impact on all of us. Here at Father's House, we pride ourselves on welcoming people. The science is welcome home. It's a place of refuge for anybody that feels left out, vulnerable, alienated, that they don't fit in. It's why people come to the community cafe. It's why people have been coming to the church that perhaps don't feel they fit into the church, but they come here, they don't feel judged, they don't feel ashamed. They just feel loved and valued and part of a family. And that's one of the things I love about the church in general, not just us, the whole of the church. You know, the churches across Lancaster and beyond are a great and welcoming place for, for the broken. Psalm 68 verse 6 is God sets the lonely in families. And as part of God's bigger church, we've been trying to do that now for the past couple of years. And it's great to see it. But it is having an impact on that as well. Come with me to our main entrance. As I said earlier, this doesn't just affect us at Father's House. You know, here we, we have a sign here, just re-emphasizing once again that due to the government guidelines and restrictions, we can no longer meet for Sunday services or midweek meetings, which is why we're moving online. You know, and it, it's also stopped 
uh, our Cafe Irresistible and our Little God's Parents and Toddlers group. But more than that, it's a street cafe. You know, we can move online, we can still meet, but it's the broken and vulnerable, those that don't get a meal, those that have got no roof over their head. You know, last Saturday we were able to run a takeaway and we were packed out with people because they had nowhere else to go. From this Saturday we can't even do that. Everything is shut down. These are very strange times that we're living in. It's almost like being in a movie. It's almost like we're all bit part actors in an apocalyptic movie. Well, the world is going to pieces, everything's falling apart, everything's in decay, nobody knows what's gonna happen, it looks really grim. It's almost like the day is about to end and nobody has got any answers. It's like the sun has gone down on the days that we know that everything that we understand and comprehend is seemingly coming to an end but the reality is that after every sunset there is a sunrise there is a new day coming so what do we do so what if anything can we do well there's one word that springs to mind at this moment uh, and it's a word worth recalling in any time of crisis and that word is remember. And we can do that in two ways. First way is this, to remember all the great things that God has done for us. He is still God. How quickly do we forget when things start to go wrong? All the amazing things that God has done for us in the past. Well, we've seen breakthrough, God's provision, God's love, God's care uh, directly or through other, through the people around us, it's been obvious God has been at work. Some of us have even seen miracles and how quickly we forget. Deuteronomy 4 9 says this, but watch out, be very careful never to forget what you have seen the Lord do for you. Do not let these things escape from your mind as long as you live and be sure to pass them on to your children and your grandchildren. What it's saying is don't forget Remember the things God has done, but don't just remember it for yourself. Remember it for the sake of your children and even your children's children if you have to. So often in this world, we, we always focus on ourselves and especially in families, we can forget that, you know, when we're stressed, our kids get stressed too. So it's, it's essential we remember how great God is, that God is still in control, that there is still hope. God has not forgotten us and that we let our kids know that too, and let them see that even in times of crisis, and it's a great lesson for them to carry through life, that God can be trusted if we remember all the great things he's done. The second thing about remembering is this, that we have to remember we are not the only generation, we are not the only people who have suffered great challenges. There are those who have gone before us, who have seen great challenges and seen God bring them through too. And that's comforting, you know. It's not like we're experiencing something nobody's ever experienced before. You know, there's people who've gone through the war. There are people going through war and having to flee countries, even as we speak now. And we, we can learn from that and be encouraged. 2 Corinthians 1 verses 8 to 10 says this. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure far beyond our ability to cope and endure. Does that sound familiar? So that we even began to despair for our own lives. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death, that overwhelming feeling of doom. But this happened, it says, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. How true is that? Who raises the dead? He has delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us on him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us how great is that so let us remember that god has delivered us before i'm sure that every one of you listening in or watching this if you think hard enough and maybe even not that hard We'll be able to tell stories where God has showed up before, before you uh, and delivered you. 
and he will continue to do so. That's what he does. That is that is his character. Uh, I, I love how they say it in Africa when Fen and I were in Kenya. That saying, God is good all the time, you know, and all the time God is good. But they always add it at the end of it, for that is his nature. God can't be anything else but good. And that is really comforting. You know, God wants the best for us. We might be under pressure. We might be challenged. We might be in difficult circumstances all around us. But that does not mean to say we're going to be crushed because God will not abandon us. Just as he didn't abandon his servant Paul. If, if you're taking notes, have a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 to 12 and read that in your own time. But let me read to you from further along in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to read from verses 23 to 28. And this is Paul talking about the challenges uh, and the pressure he's faced through his life, not just once, but throughout his life. And he says this, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned and that's with rocks before you misinterpret that. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger when in the country, in danger when out at sea, and in danger from false brothers, people who claimed to be friends or pretended to be friends but were really enemies and had let him down. I have laboured and I have toiled and I have often gone without sleep. I think a few of us would relate to that. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and I have been naked. Besides everything else, I also face the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. How crazy is that with Paul? That in spite of all of that, his biggest concern, the pressure he's feeling the most is his love for other people. And he can't do anything about it at this time. What a heart. But when God gets hold of your heart, that's what happens. You love at a different level. You love yourself less than other people's more. And you have to trust that God will provide people around you to love you, to compensate for that. And another thing about pressure is this. Pressure, it, it's known as a scientific fact. Pressure forms. Pressure forms coal into a diamond over time. It forms us, it tests us. So we can't avoid pressure, but we can learn how to deal with it. And how we respond to pressure matters. So rather than react, we should respond and think through our response. Because if we don't, pressure can cause us to do some strange things. Pressure can make us feel very alone and forgotten. You know, especially in, when you're living in isolation. How many of you feel forgotten by God? forgotten by people, overlooked, unworthy, don't think well of yourself. Pressure can do that and it comes at us through work, through family, through a whole host of different areas. And we have to recognise the signs of it and what it's doing to us. Because the enemy, Satan, wants to use pressure and will use pressure to crush our hopes and dreams, to undermine our commitment to loving God and to loving each other as people and loving his church. And yet God has set us apart. God has called us, because, not because we're great, but because he is, and he sees this potential in us as a wonderful father. And he's called us to be different because he believes in us even when we don't. So the best thing we can do is respond to that and say, hey, because you believe in me, God, I wanna start believing in myself. I wanna live differently rather than cave into pressure. So how can we recognise pressure when it's happening around us and then respond to pressure rather than react? First thing is this. Remember that pressure will change your perspective. It always does. Great change always forces a change of perspective on us. It can make us see things differently, see people differently, even see ourselves differently. And one of the major causes of that, and this is a natural human reaction, so don't beat yourself up about this, is fear and uncertainty. 
when there's uncertainty, there's always fear. And when there's fear, it brings about uncertainty. And we, and we how are we going to cope? How are we going to find a way through this? That that can find its way in so many areas. So when pressure through uh, whatever circumstances, you know, being let down, job, uh, and you've suffered with anxiety, or this current pandemic is making you feel under pressure and alone, the, the perspective is that we can often have this, that this is going to be like this always, you know, that we'll always be alone, that nobody can ever love us or nobody cares for us. And that's just not true. It's not true. So it's really important that we maintain the right perspective. And do you know what I've found to be the best perspective of all? Of all? God's perspective, the kingdom perspective on life. 2 Corinthians 8 verses 1 to 2 says this. Now I want to tell you, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his love and kindness has done for the churches in Macedonia, though they've been going through much trouble and hard times, Yet their wonderful joy and deep poverty have overflowed into rich generosity. So here's a church where whatever situation it was, Paul doesn't elaborate on it, but he's saying they are really struggling. Whatever they're going through, it's put them into deep poverty, as it is doing with people at this time. There are people who have been forced out of work. You know, I think of the self-employed uh, I'm one of them, you know, uh, and work has dried up. They're not allowed to work, so there's no money. How do they look after themselves and their family? They're, they're, they're struggling to cope. They're really feeling the pressure. And yet Paul is talking about a group of people in this church under immense pressure because of extreme poverty. And yet, because they wanted to have the God perspective, it led to them having great joy and generous hearts. It doesn't make sense in our world. But it makes sense in God's world, in the kingdom. What a perspective to, to have. To not be led by fear and uncertainty, but to be led by God and the Holy Spirit. See, the right perspective can help us to realise what is truly important. I think many of us are realising that. With so many things being taken away from us, we're beginning to realise what really matters. And for me, that's God and people. You can keep the rest. You know, pressure when we allow it to affect us, you know, and we react to it, we get the wrong perspective. And the wrong p perspective can cause us to become depressed or even more depressed if that is something we suffer with anyway. It can cause us to not value ourselves and think that nobody else will either. But praise God that from his word and from his Holy Spirit and from godly people, we can gain the right perspective. Can I encourage you to read Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 27, where it talks about do not worry, you know. And remember, you know, if, you, if you're, especially if you're watching this and you're alone, or you're really feeling this pressure and you're feeling alone and forgotten, that is not true. God says you are not alone. You are not forgotten. You are known. You are loved. You are cared for. He values you. Second thing about this with pressure, we need to realise that pressure will change our priorities. If we react, it'll make us focus and prioritise on things that often don't do us good, certainly not in the long term, uh, and can cause lots of damage to ourselves and those around us. How many people, you know, for fear and when under pressure and anxiety, react out of anger and say hurtful things and do hurtful things and behave in hurtful ways. You know, and we have to be aware of this. Whether you want it to or not, pressure will change our priorities. So certainly it is better to let pressure change our priorities in a good way rather than a negative way. And this is a time where we're obviously under pressure. So we're going to have to learn to readjust and reevaluate what our priorities are. And many people are already realising this. So I what I wanted to say to you is this. Let us use this time where we, we have uh, less contact. And yes, we miss that. I, I miss that terribly meeting with people. I don't know about you, but I really miss that. I love being church, meeting with people and doing church together. So let's use this time to get closer to God and to get closer to people. Now, getting closer to God, you know, we can do that through worship, getting into his word, 
uh, praying and just talking, being brutally honest with God about how we're feeling. We don't have to hide anything from him. He knows it all anyway. Stop being religious. Just be honest. And closer to people. Yes, I know we have social distancing and measures in place, but we have modern technology. We can ring people. We can video call them. We can do group chats and group studies. We can still stay in touch. You know, it's uh, if you're living in a block of flats, then do what they've done in Italy and uh, get outside on your balcony and start singing. Although in my case, that might drive people further away, but give it a go if you want. Get closer to God, get closer to people. See, I believe this, love isn't love when it's only something we study or talk about. Love is only love when love is lived out. People need to see theology with skin on. They need to feel the love of God. It can't just be theology. You know, one of the things that Jesus did, especially with lepers and the untouchables, was touch. That wonderful, beautiful intimacy of touch to say, do you know what? When everybody else rejects you and says you're unclean, I want to tell you you're not. And I want to make you whole. That's that's God's business, making us whole. People need to see Jesus, not opinions, fear and judgment. It, it concerns me slightly that on social media, Christians are posting stuff at this time, that this is God's judgment on the nations. It may be. It may be. You know, I, I, who am I to say? But what does concern me is that so many things are often posted out there where there is no love for people. It's all about judgment. And God will judge. He promises that. God will judge the nations. You know, but he came to give us a chance to respond. You know, the Bible says God is not willing that anyone should perish. That's his heart. Now, we know that not everybody is going to be saved. But that's not God's heart. God would love everybody to be saved. But that is our choice. You know, but let's love like God. Let's stop being judgmental and forcing religious opinions that often have no grounding, it's just our opinion, and making people feel worse when what they really need is to feel loved. Loving people is what God wants us to do. This matters more than church programmes. It matters more than having loads of stuff we don't really need. It matters more than wasting too much time on ourselves and what we like to do and forgetting about others. And it matters more than ever when we're living in an age where people are literally dying around us. Not just of coronavirus. People are dying around us because they're taking their own lives, because they feel isolated and alone. How can we continue to carry on living selfishly and forcing our opinions out when the world is crying out for love? Church, to finish, I want to say this. I believe this. Uh, you may disagree, but I believe this that this is a time to reevaluate, maybe even a God-given time to reevaluate our lives. And perhaps for some of us, press the reset button. I believe that in spite of how bad things may look at this time, this is actually a time of opportunity. A time of opportunity to get a different perspective and learn to love better and care for each other more. I also want to encourage you, if you're struggling, please don't give up on hope. If you're really struggling, get in touch, contact us. We will do whatever we can to keep in touch with you and, and try and help you. Finally, let us draw closer to God. We've got the time to do it. How many of us as leaders are too busy? Well, so we're still busy, but we definitely have more time. So let's draw closer to God. Let us draw closer to people, not just while this pandemic is in place, but for the rest of our lives. Let's re-evaluate how much people matter. And when the pandemic ends, continue to draw closer to people. And finally, I can't say it any better than God himself says it. Let perfect love cast out all fear. May God bless you at this time, even in this strange time of trying circumstances. God does care. God does love you. We can get through this, but let's stay in touch. Let's love God. Let's love each other. Let us not lose hope. Be blessed. In Jesus' name. Bye.